Now, Graham, um, it's lovely to see each of you today. Um, isn't the Lord faithful and good? Don't know what your week's been like. And maybe great, maybe pretty tough. Um, but the Lord has brought us here again. He's been good to us. And um, we're going to hear his word now. Let me pray as we begin. Father in heaven, we thank you uh, for your faithfulness to us uh, today. And we ask now that we would know you speaking to us, um, both here and for the, the kids in their groups. And as Graham has said, that we might see something of you now. In Jesus' name, amen. It's been a joy to be in the book of Galatians with you. Uh, and we come to the end of Galatians today. So please turn back to page 1172. Um, and next week we'll return to Deuteronomy and I resume our series in that great book next Sunday. I'll begin with an apology to Hannah. I, um, I try when I use my children or Hannah in an illustration to ask them in advance if that's okay. I've forgotten to do that with Hannah this time, but uh, she'll be merciful to me, I hope. Um, when I was first getting to know Hannah, um, I wanted to know how to please her. It was nearly Christmas time. And in London, one of the romantic things to do at that time was to go ice skating. And uh, Hannah said to me at the time, whatever you do, please don't even think about inviting me ice skating. And I never have invited her ice skating. Um, because I want to please her. Well, even more importantly, how to please God's Holy Spirit. How to please God's Holy Spirit. Look at verse 8 with me. So page 1172, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 8. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. How to please God's Spirit, God's Holy Spirit. Isn't it amazing that we, little me, could even please God, the Holy Spirit? How to do that? Uh, the book of Galatians is quite simple in a way. The first two chapters is Paul's defending his authority to teach the good news about Jesus. Then chapters 3 and 4 is the good news about Jesus. It's about faith. <coughs> that we're justified and made right in God's sight, not by our works, but by faith, uh, as Stephen was sharing with us. And then the last two chapters um, are about freedom. Uh, faith, and then freedom. Uh, the freedom that faith brings. Uh, not freedom to do wrong, to disobey God, but freedom to obey God. Freedom even to please God, the Holy Spirit, amazingly. And you remember at the end of chapter 5, there's a war of desires going on within every Christian. On the one hand, uh, there's uh, at my flesh. That is my old sinful nature, um, which is trying to bear fruits bad fruits, the fruits of lust and all her hell-bent cronies. And on the other hand, there's the Holy Spirit in my heart, who's trying to, well, who is, uh, producing uh, good fruits, fruits of love and all her heaven-sent friends. There's this battle of desires in my heart. Well, how to keep in step with the Spirit? How to please the Spirit, especially in relationships, as he's trying to grow those that fruit. Some of us may naturally be tempted to be people pleasers. We have a desperate longing to please other people. Uh, and that can be attractive, but the danger is it ends up being enslaving, and actually what pleases other people might not be the best for them. Others of us may naturally aim to please ourselves. Uh, the temptation is not to care what other people think, we just go our own way. That single-mindedness can be effective, uh, but it can be very destructive to other people, and we can end up uh, hurting them and finding more loneliness than love. Well, rather than being people-pleasers, or focusing on pleasing ourselves, how can we please God's Holy Spirit? God's Spirit is a tiny bit like Orpheus, remember that ship's captain. Um, how did he help his sailors to sail safely past the, the destructive music of, of the sirens, or well, he played a more beautiful song uh, on the deck of his ship. And as Christians sail in the freedom that Christ has brought for us, how to sail safely past the rocks of people-pleasing 
and self-pleasing on our journey to heaven and relate with others in a way that pleases him. Let's see uh, three points. First, care for others carefully. Secondly, don't compare ourselves with others. Thirdly, boast in the cross of Christ. First, care for others carefully. Look down, please, at verse... Well, chapter 5, end of chapter 5, verse 26. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Let's care for others carefully. If someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person gently. Now, I, I like to please people, but there's a challenge there straight away for people pleasers. Uh, if a Christian friend is out of mind, if a Christian friend is out of line, uh, I need gently to bring them back into line. Uh, now, what does this mean? Uh, where it says, if someone is caught in a sin, what does that mean? Does that mean I've, I've caught someone out? Aha! Uh-huh, I've caught you sinning. Uh, no. Uh, elsewhere, the Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Uh, but it probably means if a Christian friend is caught as in a net by their sins, and they're in a pattern of sinning it sing in a particular way, and we can see it's being destructive to them, care for others carefully by helping them out of that net. Now, not in a conceited way, end of chapter 5, how easy it is for that conversation to be conceited. Well, I, I feel better, because I'm not sinning in that way. Um, or because we're secretly envious, so I, I wish I was sinning in that way. Now, think, what's in my heart? And how does the gospel speak into this? And how do I communicate in a way that maybe be best received? And am I in danger of being sucked into a similar sin in, in my head, if not with my hands? Care for others. Care for others, verse 2, by carrying each other's burdens. Now, what does that mean, carrying each other's burdens? Well, I suppose it's a bit like, imagine you're at a railway station, and someone's trying to go up some steps with a very heavy suitcase, and they're struggling. Uh, And you see the suitcase has two handles, and you say, well, uh, let me help you, I'll take one handle, we'll do this together. In the same way, care for each other by carrying each other's burdens. Now, the burdens could be all sorts of things, couldn't they? They could be struggling with kids, struggling with parents, a battling with temptation, money problems, all sorts of things. Is there some way we could help them carry that burden? And as we do so, verse 2, we're fulfilling the law of Christ. Now, what does that mean, that as, as we love others, we're fulfilling the law of Christ? Does that mean we're fulfilling the law of Christ in the sense that, ah, suddenly now we're ticking all God's laws? And actually, suddenly now, I deserve to go to heaven on my own merit. Well, no, it can't be that. Because Paul spent the whole book of Galatians teaching that's not right. We're justified not by works, but by faith. On the other hand, this idea that loving others fulfills the law of Christ, does that mean that actually we can stop obeying the details of God's words where that's inconvenient or uh, culturally tricky and just say that vague love is all that matters, that love is love, as they say. Well, absolutely not. When Jesus explained in Matthew chapter 5 how he does fulfill the law, he actually raised the bar higher. But love fulfills the law of Christ in this sense. Jesus was the perfect example of love, of caring each other's burdens. Uh, And he taught us to love one another as he did. That was the new command that he gave to us. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. And we also should lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Let's care for each other carefully by carrying each other's burdens and by doing good. By doing good. Look at verse 9. Verse 9. 
Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Let's do good to all people. All people. Maybe you're at work uh, and you see a colleague is struggling to complete some task. And you say to them, let me help you with that. It won't benefit you, it'll set you back, but let me help you with that. Or maybe at, at school, you can see that a youngster is upset. Someone's been mean to them, perhaps, or, or they're on their own. And you say to them, look, I, I'm going to lunch, or I'm going to this activity. Do you want to come with me? It'd be fun if you wanted to. Maybe in the streets. Uh, your neighbour is struggling with life, generally. And you say to them, can I mow your lawn? Can I babysit your children? Can I give you a lift? Whatever it is. Do good. Do good to all. And especially do good to the family of believers. Maybe we feel overwhelmed by the needs. So many people we could do good to. And where do we start? Uh, we'll start with the church family. Jesus said, this is how they will know you're my disciples. If you love one another. Maybe even there, uh, we also feel overwhelmed. Even in the church family, so many people we could do good to where to start. Uh, well, even there, start with your small group, perhaps. I, I don't mean just your kind of uh, closed clique of similar friends, but hopefully each of us at church is in a Bible study group or a youth group or a ministry team or, or several of the above. And that's a little community and a good place to start doing good, caring for one another, and then take it beyond that. Well, how to relate with others in a way that pleases God's spirit. First, care for others carefully. But as we care for others, there is a great big trap that we could fall into, and that trap is to compare ourselves with others. So secondly, don't compare ourselves with others. See, just because I'm helping somebody who's perhaps uh, slipped up in some sin doesn't mean for an instant that I'm better or more valuable than them. Uh, We've already seen, end of chapter 5, let's not think we're better, let's not be conceited than them. Uh, And now we see, let's not even compare ourselves with them at all. Look at chapter 6, verse 4. Each one should test their own actions, then they can take pride in themselves alone, without comparing themselves to someone else. For each one should carry their own load. The author Tim Keller writes, The way the normal human ego tries to fill its emptiness and deal with its discomfort is by comparing itself to other people all the time. The way the normal human ego tries to fill its emptiness and deal with its discomfort is by comparing itself to other people all the time. Let's not do that. Let's not be constantly criticizing other people. Let's test our own actions. What against what standard? Again, not against the standard of other people. Uh, That would only make us arrogant or despairing. Let's test our actions against how we did yesterday and how we could have done today and how the Lord could help us to do tomorrow. And then when it's just between me and God, and I've thrown out all those unhelpful comparisons, and I'm trusting in God alone, and if I do see the Holy Spirit producing some good fruit in my life, uh, then it's okay quietly to take pride in in the sense of being pleased with thankfulness to him, because it's all down to him. Don't compare ourselves with others, but verse 5, each one should carry their own load. Now, if you're beady eyes, you might say, Reuben, isn't that a contradiction? Hasn't he just said in verse 2, carry your neighbor's burden? Now he's saying, carry your own load. What's the difference? Well, can you spot the difference between those two phrases in verse 2 and verse 5? I carry my neighbor's burden, but I carry my own load. It's a slightly different thing. My neighbor's burden is that heavy and painful weight around their neck. My load is like my backpack, if you like. It's the, 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 it's 
uh, my gifts and opportunities and responsibilities, which are particular to me. If they're stumbling under a heavy burden, help them with it. But what about, about my back? My particular gifts and opportunities. My responsibility is to use them for the Lord and for his people. How to relate with others in a way that pleases God's spirit in our hearts. First, care for others carefully. But secondly, don't compare ourselves with one another. Now, does that mean that I get to go around boasting in myself? How much I care for others? Or how much I'm not comparing myself with others? Unlike that person over there. No, not at all. How to please the Spirit. Thirdly and finally, boast in the cross of Christ. Boast only in the cross of Christ. Look at chapter 6, please, and verse 11. See what large, le- large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. It's a curious phrase. It suggests that um, a scribe has been writing for Paul up until now, and now Paul's going to finish off the letter, and there's a debate. It, it might mean that his eyesight is very poor, so he writes with big letters. It might just be, mean that he's emphasising, uh, so big letters for emphasis. doesn't matter. Verse 12. Those who want to impress people by means of the flesh are trying to compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are circumcised keep the law. Yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your circumcision in the flesh. May I never boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. It looks like some uh, leaders in the church in Galatia or perhaps visitors to the church there were boasting about their success in ministry. Look at what I've achieved. Those Christians over there, they've done what I've told them to. They've become like me and got circumcised. Well done me. They'll definitely get to heaven now. No, Paul says, that's not right. May I never boast except in the cross of Christ. Now, does that mean that I can't be happy with something that I've done? that I've got to keep all my achievements a secret. Uh, Well, no. Paul's just said it's okay quietly to take pride uh, without conceited comparisons with other people, but by recognising it's God's spirit at work with thankfulness. But Paul is summarising the big message of Galatians, which is this. The gospel is how we begin the Christian life, and the gospel is how we continue in the Christian life. The way on is the way in. Uh, Not by my works, Not by boasting in myself, but by faith in Christ. Those Christians, he says, who want you to keep the Jewish ceremonial laws, they don't even manage it themselves. There's nothing wrong with being circumcised or or not being circumcised. Nothing wrong with going to an independent evangelical church or a Baptist church or an Anglican church. Nothing wrong with a contemporary style of service or a traditional style of service. Nothing wrong with going to more Christian meetings or spending that time evangelizing non-Christians. There might be good reasons to choose one over the other, and each one should make up their own minds. But none of these will get you any closer to God or any further away from him. If we think we're closer to God because I get praise for my service at church, or I'm quietly praying at home and no one's noticing. Or my job is teaching the Bible. Or my job is making money and giving lots of it away. Or I brought lots of friends to the church youth group. Or I'm always helping people. No, not a bit of it. May I never boast, except in the cross of Christ. That is the only way to be close to God, by trusting that Jesus died to take the blame for all my unrighteousness and all my righteousness. Sorry, my, and all my self-righteousness, righteousness, I should say. And he rose again. And all that counts now is that he has so graciously and undeservedly made me a new creation. I've been crucified with Christ. And I no longer live, but Jesus Christ lives in me. I never want to boast in anything again except in the cross of Christ. Now, what does that word boast mean? Well, it can't mean boasting in the sense of, of my own achievements. Perhaps it's nearer to rejoicing. I want to rejoice only in the cross of Christ, to glory 
in that. I'm so excited that Jesus died for me. I didn't deserve it. But I reckon if I'd been the only sinner in the world, he still have died for me. If he's done that for you, uh, he must love you so much. And if he's done it for me, he can do it for you. He can accept you. And if he's done that for me, how valuable must I be now in his sight? How loved must I be? Maybe you're here and you know that you, you can't boast in the cross of Christ because you're not trusting in Jesus Christ as your Saviour and Lord. And all you have to boast in to depend on is everything else. May I say, everything else is so unreliable. Those savings you depended on, they could be so easily wiped out by inflation or unwise investments um, or unforeseen costs. You might depend on being popular or having people say, I'm proud of you. But so easily, one mistake that could be lost. How easily we might let people down or people might let us down. Foolish things to boast in and depend on. The singer Madonna once said, my drive in life comes from a fear of being mediocre. I push past one spell of mediocrity and I discover myself as a special human being, uh, but then I feel I'm still mediocre and uninteresting unless I do something else. Uh, Because even though I've become somebody, I still have to prove that I am somebody. My struggle has never ended, and I guess it never will. Very honest, perceptive words from Madonna. Now, I, I may not be the pop superstar that Madonna is, uh, but I know that I'm not mediocre, and I don't have to prove myself, because Jesus died and rose from me, and that makes me worth something. Let's boast only in the cross of Christ. Maybe take a moment after this service to turn in prayer that the Lord will help us to find our identity and our joy, not in the many things we might do, but in Christ. To turn to Christ who lived and died for us, rose and reigns, and will return to put all things right. And then we'll begin to be able to please God's Holy Spirit. And then he'll begin to be pleased with our little acts of service. Done done not so I can boast in myself or even boast to myself. Not so I can compare myself with other people. Um, But because I love him. And I know that he loves me. And I love his people and I want to care for his people. How to please God's spirit. First, care for others carefully. Secondly, don't compare ourselves with others Thirdly, boast in the cross of Christ alone. Father in heaven, we're sorry when we failed in these areas. We haven't always cared for other people. Uh, We've often compared ourselves with other people. We've boasted in many things that are not the cross of Christ. Please forgive us. Thank you for your amazing forgiveness. Uh, Please would you help us to find our identity our worth and our praise in Christ and his cross and then to be full of your overflowing grace to care for others without thinking of ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Before Graham closes, we're going to...